All right, so today's lesson is on heat and temperature and the difference between them, as well as specific heat and phase change concepts. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is temperature. So temperature is the average kinetic energy of the particles of a substance. So basically when we have a substance, like sometimes we think of this particle model of the solids, we have all these particles, these molecules together, they're pretty rigid if it's a solid, uh, but really these are moving. There's some vibration with these molecules, they're moving in other ways that basically these particles are not stationary. So if we have a higher temperature that tells us that the kinetic energy of the particles are, is higher so therefore they're moving faster. So basically the connection you want to know here is the higher the temperature the higher the kinetic energy. So temperature tells us how hot or cold something is relative to another substance. So basically if the particles are moving faster, it's going to feel hotter. If they're moving slower, it's going to feel colder. So basically if something, if we have two uh, objects, let's say A and B, and A has particles that are moving faster, it's going to feel hotter. It's, it's going to be a higher temperature relative to B. So if we're talking about energy though, that is what we're talking about with heat. Heat is a form of energy. It's thermal energy. So it's thermal energy that is transferred between objects that are at different temperatures. So if we take two objects that are, let's say one is hot and one is cold, there's going to be a transfer of energy because energy always flows between objects at different temperatures. We have a, a high temperature object here, something that's hot. Energy is going to flow from that to the cold object. So it's very important, heat always flows from hot to cold. So if we have like, let's say uh, we take our hand and we go and touch this hot object, what's gonna happen is the heat from this hot object is gonna flow into our hand and it's gonna make us feel, our, our hand feel hot. But let's say we take our hand and we go and touch this cold object. What's not, what's not happening is that cold flows from this object into our hand. What is happening is that the heat from our hand flows into this cold object. So heat always flows from hot to cold. That's a very important concept to know. So if we touch something hot, the heat from that hotter object is gonna flow into our hands. But if we touch something cold, it's the heat from our hands that flows into that cold object. So we feel cold because there's a bunch of heat that leaves our hand here but it is not because the cold from this object comes and flows into our hand. Heat always flows from hot to cold, very important. So also here, another important note that the law of conservation of energy tells us that we can't create or destroy energy, which means that whenever we lose energy somewhere, we have to gain it somewhere else. So in these cases, if we lose energy from this hot object into our hand, our hand is what gains the energy. In this case, if we lose the heat from our hand, the cold object gains that energy. All right, so a couple important concepts there with heat and temperature. The next thing we're gonna talk about is two types of energy changes. One is called exothermic and one is endothermic. So if we have a release or a loss of energy, that's called exothermic. If we have a gain or an absorption of energy, that's called endothermic. So endothermic is if we're gaining energy, exothermic is if we're losing energy. So in this case, uh, the change for our hand when we're gaining heat from this hot object, this would be an endothermic change looked at from the perspective of our hand. With the cold object here, this would be exothermic for our hand because our hand is giving off energy to this cold object. So with exothermic, we're saying this is a negative change because we're losing it. So if we have, let's say, negative 50, joules of heat, that would be uh, reflective of an exothermic change. And joules here, joules is just the unit for energy, just like grams is the unit for mass, joules is the unit for energy. So if we're gaining energy though, that would be a positive change. So if we have something like positive 50 joules, that means we gained 50 joules of energy and this would be an endothermic change. All right, so a couple of concepts there with heat and temperature. So one of the important things we're gonna do with this energy, uh, with these energy concepts is specific heat. So what specific heat is, is the energy that we need to transfer uh, to, that we need to be transferred to an object 
to raise its temperature by one degree if we have a gram of the object. So the energy we need to raise the temperature of an object of one gram by one degree Celsius. So this specific heat is what goes in the blank here. So for water, this value is found in table B. That's on the front page of your reference table. There's a whole bunch of constants for water there. Okay, not a whole bunch, there's three. Uh, but the specific heat of water is 4.18. So for water, the value is 4.18. And the units here are joules per gram Kelvin. So what this tells us is that if we want to raise the temperature of water by one Kelvin, which is going to be equal to one degree Celsius, so we can just think of it like that because that's the units you probably know at this point. If we want to raise the temperature of water by one degree Celsius and we have one gram of water, it's going to take 4.18 joules to make that change. So if we have 100 grams of water, it's going to take more energy. If we want to raise the temperature of water by 20 degrees instead of 1, it's also going to take more energy. So for every gram we have and every degree we want to raise it, it takes 4.18 joules of energy of heat to do that. So in other words, the higher the specific heat, the more energy we need to produce a certain temperature change. So if we have something like a metal, metals have very low specific heats generally. So if we have, let's say, 0.5 for some unknown metal as the specific heat, that means that to raise one gram of this metal by one degree will take 0.5 joules of energy. So it's going to take a lot less energy to raise this metal one degree than it will to raise water. Water has a very high specific heat compared to some other substances. So mathematically, what we're going to do here is use this equation Q equals MC delta T. So this is given to you on the back of your reference table on the very back page with all those equations, and it tells you what all these variables mean, so you don't need to memorize them. Q is heat, M is mass, C is specific heat, and delta T is the change in temperature. So this is not two variables here, it's just one variable, delta T. It means the change in temperature. The, the delta part means change. So this is the change in temperature and how we're going to do that is always final minus initial. This is very important. When you go to calculate the temperature change, you have to always subtract the final temperature minus the initial temperature. All right, so let's try a couple of examples out here. We've got 200 grams of water, so that's our mass. We've got a temperature change here, that's our delta T because we're going from 87 to 19 degrees Celsius and we're looking for the heat, so Q is our unknown. So we go and plug into this equation, Q equals MC delta T. Q is our unknown, so we'll leave it as Q equals M, which is our mass, 200 grams, times the specific heat. In this case, it's water. So you could look this up in table B, but we know from up here it's 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius, or Kelvin. And the temperature change here, we do final minus initial. So this is our final, final what we end up with, so 19 minus our initial, which was 87. All right, so we're going to subtract this 19 from the 87, and that, or subtract the 19 by 87, and that will give us negative 68 for our temperature change, so we can kind of simplify that there. And then we just multiply these straight across and get a final answer here. So uh, I believe this comes out to somewhere along the lines of 34,000 something or other joules. Uh, so really this is uh, how much heat would be required to make this temperature change for this amount of water. So uh, basically we just need to know how to plug into Q equals MC delta T here. Sorry about that, just a quick note here. Uh, I got my numbers confused from earlier in class today, but this doesn't end up being 34,000. It ends up being uh, 56,848, uh, and this would be in joules because we're talking about heat. So I'm going to let you do the other two examples on your own here so we can save some time. Uh, again, we're just solving using Q equals MC delta T, but if you want the answers here, this is 19.2 grams for this first one here and then down here how much heat is gained it's going to be uh, 45,144 joules of heat gained. Alright so using Q equals MC delta T we just gotta know what each variable means so Q is heat, M is mass, and C is the specific heat and we're just going to plug each variable into that and then solve for whatever unknown we might have. 
All right, so the next thing we're gonna do here is talk about phase change. So phase change, uh, we can kind of think through it uh, logically using kind of the, some of the energy concepts we already know. So if we heat a substance, that's gonna cause the temperature to increase, right? We just talked about when we're heating a substance, that's gonna cause an increase in temperature. If we're removing heat, that would cause a decrease in temperature. But here, let's say we're heating a substance, we're increasing the heat, that would increase the temperature. So if we're increasing the temperature, that's gonna cause the particles to move faster. This is based on the definition of temperature that we just established. If the, if the temperature is higher, that means the particles are moving faster. They have more kinetic energy. So if they're moving faster, the collisions between the molecules, they'd be harder. Because let's say we have two molecules that are moving really fast and they collide together, they're gonna to collide really hard as opposed to if we have two molecules that are moving really slow and they bump into each other, they would be a really weak collision. You can think of it in terms of a car crash. If you have two cars who crash at five miles an hour versus two cars who crash at 50 miles an hour, the 50 miles an hour is gonna be a harder crash, right? So because we have these molecules moving faster, it's gonna be a harder collision between them. If they're colliding harder, they're gonna be pushed farther apart by those collisions. So if we think of uh, throwing a tennis ball against a wall, if you throw it against a wall weakly, it's not gonna bounce off as hard, but if you throw it against the wall really hard, it's gonna bounce back and maybe hit you in the face. So the, hard, the harder collision is gonna lead to uh, basically the, a higher recoil that's gonna push these molecules further apart. So once they get further apart, then the attractions between the molecules are going to decrease because we're dealing with charge and basically the closer two charged objects get together the the more uh, the, the more the greater the force is going to be and we could also think in terms of gravity the closer two things are gravitationally the stronger the force is going to be so because they're farther apart they're going to have weaker attractions here so if they have weaker attractions, this is what enables phase change. So this, this five-step process that we walk through, that's what enables phase change, is that if we increase the temperature, the particles move faster, they collide harder, they move further apart because of that, and then they have fewer attractions. So if they're not held together as tightly, that means that a solid can melt, because we talked about the differences between a solid, where the molecules are rigid, a liquid, where they're a little more free-flowing, and then a gas, where they're kind of all spread out all over the place. So if we're not having as high of attractions, we could go from solid to liquid to gas, and that's how phase change can happen. So if a substance is cooled, we're basically just going the other way. So if it's cooled, uh, the temperature will decrease, the molecules will be moving slower, they'd be colliding more weakly, they'd then be closer together, and the attractions would increase because of that, and that's how we would go from a gas to a solid the other way. So an important concept here, during a phase change, the temperature stays the same. So that's very important to note because it takes energy to do this phase change. The temperature is gonna stay the same while the energy is being uh, used for the phase change instead of the temperature change. So the amount of heat required for a phase change is affected by the amount of the substance and what substance it is. So a couple of definitions we have here. Uh, the m When a substance is changing from a solid to a liquid, that temperature that that happens is called the melting point. So the melting point is the temperature where a solid changes to a liquid. The amount of energy that we need to change one unit of mass from a solid to a liquid, and usually one gram we'd be talking about here, that would be the heat of fusion. So that's how much energy we need to melt a certain uh, substance, one gram of that substance. So if we're going from a liquid to a gas, the temperature that that happens is called the boiling point. So the boiling point tells us the temperature at which a liquid changes to a gas. And then the amount of energy we need is the heat of vaporization. So the heat of vaporization, how much energy we need to change one gram of a substance from a liquid to a gas. All right, so just a couple of definitions to remember there. And again, these are all on your vocab list on page three. So we've got a couple equations here. Sorry about that. A couple of equations here to talk about phase changes with. So if we're dealing with vaporization, which would be evaporation or the other way, going from gas to liquid would be condensation. 
or if we're melting using fu the heat of fusion or the other way would be freezing, we're going to use these two equations here. So this one with the heat of fusion is for melting or freezing, and this one with the heat of vaporization is for evaporation or condensation. So these equations are a little more straightforward than the previous ones. We've got Q is still heat, M is still mass, and then HV and HF are the heat of vaporization and heat of fusion for each of these equations respectively. And again, all of these values can be found in table B in your reference table. So if we go to use these equations, uh, how much heat is required to melt a four kilogram block of ice? So the first thing we gotta recognize here is if you look in the periodic table, or look in your reference table, uh, the units are in grams for both of these uh, substances. Uh, actually, it's, it's joules per gram, but for uh, the mass, we need to use grams. So because we have four kilograms here, we need to convert that to grams. So this four kilograms, using the front page of your reference table, you have all those metric prefixes, we would then know that this is 4,000 grams. Alright, so we have 4,000 grams of ice, and again we want to use grams because that's the unit uh, that corresponds with the, the heat of fusion here. So because we're melting, uh, how much is required to completely melt, that's going to be heat of fusion. So we're just going to plug straight into this equation. We're looking for the heat. That's our unknown. So Q equals the mass is 4,000. And then the heat of fusion for water is 334. So when we multiply these two together, we end up with uh, 1,336,000 even. And that's all we got here. So uh, that's how you calculate heat of fusion, is just using uh, your heat of fusion value from the reference table and uh, plugging into Q equals MHF. And then to do this second one here, uh, we have the heat, so the heat is 81 kilojoules, and again we have kilo here, we gotta convert this to joules, so that would be 81,000 joules equals our mass, which is what we're looking for, how many grams, that's our unknown, mass times, here we're talking about condensation, so that's dealing with the heat of vaporization. So the value for that, straight off table B, is 2260. So then to solve for M here, we just divide both sides by 2260, so then we get M equals about 35.8 grams. So that's uh, the amount of mass the, the mass of steam that we could condense by losing that much heat. Alright, so I hope this lesson on phase change, heat, and temperature was helpful. Uh, if you need to work through some of these examples, feel free to pause the video and go back and try some of them again. Thank you.